On the northern edge of South America are three small territories. Until about 10 years ago, not a single road connected them with the outside world. They sit on the edge of Latin America, and yet none of them are Latino. They're some of the world's least talked about places, and yet they have interesting stories to tell. Stories of calypso and cults, slavery and sugar. This series of videos is about the Guyanas. These videos tell stories of places and peoples as I try to find the echoes of the past in the lives of the present. This is going to be a story about the Guyanas, perched on the top of South America. Originally they came in five flavors, Spanish, British, Dutch, French, and Portuguese. But now Spanish Guyana is part of Venezuela, and Portuguese Guyana is the Brazilian state of Amapá. So when people talk about the Guyanas today, they mean these middle three, British, Dutch, and French. The modern day Guyana, Suriname, and French Guyana. Only two of them are countries because French Guyana is a department of France. In fact, France's longest border anywhere is actually with Brazil. The three Guyanas are unique in South America for never having been either Spanish or Portuguese. They are their own little worlds. In the words of travel writer John Gimlet, they've never known salsa or tango, bolivar, machismo, liberation theology. It's almost as though the giant at their backs has never existed. They are indeed their own little world. With a combined population of only 1.7 million people, the Guyanas are one of the most sparsely populated regions on Earth. Suriname, the size of Florida, has fewer people than Wichita, Kansas. Because the stories of each of the Guyanas are so interconnected, this video will tell them together up until the point of independence. At that point, the series will look at the history and context of each of Guyana, Suriname, and French Guyana in turn. So let's begin. In most of the Guyanas, the population is almost entirely concentrated on the coast, in three towns, Georgetown, Paramaribo, and Cayenne, each sitting on a major river mouth. Nine out of 10 inhabitants of the Guyanas live in this 10 mile strip along the coast. The region known as the Guyanas consists of what is called the Guyana Shield, where the rivers run south into the Amazon, that's the Amazon basin. Where they run to the Atlantic, that's the Guyana Shield. Its name comes from an Amerindian word meaning land of many waters, and that is spot on. The biggest rivers have mouths wide enough to contain the island of Barbados, but unlike many of the world's other great rivers, and make no mistake about it, these are great rivers, they are as much obstacles as highways. The rivers of the Guyanas don't allow shipping due to rapids. The only vessels that can go very far up them are canoes small enough that you can drag them across land. So the water has for the longest time sealed any interior communities off from the world, and therefore limited development. Without an airplane, it can take up to four weeks to get into the interior. All roads stick to the coast, and throughout the Guyanas, there isn't even a single natural harbor. It has not historically been a recipe for economic flourishing. Huge tracts of the Guyana Shield are only vaguely described, and each year when scientists can penetrate it, they yield new species. The Guyanas have the biggest ants in the world and the biggest freshwater fish. They have jaguars, stingrays, electric eels, and swarms of bugs ready to drink your blood. It's either an ecological paradise or a tropical hell, a land that humans have never really possessed. It starts with the muddy coastline, which gives way to swamps, then the thick rainforest. These are bound to the south by the Akarai and Tumukumak mountains, which define the rim of the Amazon basin. In the Guyana highlands, there are sandstone tabletop mountains called Tepuis. Because of their steep sides, the tops of many of these are completely separated from the jungle below, and are ecological islands, having evolved their own unique plant and animal species. They are also the source of the world's highest waterfalls, such as Angel Falls in Venezuela. And it was to visit one of these that I got up early one morning in Georgetown, Guyana, to take a plane to the mighty Kaitor Falls.
we flew over Georgetown in Southwest, deep into the interior. Throughout the Guyanas, both the regulated and unregulated gold mining is a serious problem. The work for much of it done by illegal migrants from Venezuela and Brazil, working in the shadows. The flight from Guyana's capital to its flagship tourist destination reveals mine after mine, scarring the forest. A short walk from the runway is the lookout. What a, what a view! <laughs> On this occasion, there wasn't so much to see, but luckily there are more lookouts, just a short walk through the jungle. And from there, you can see Kaitor in all its magnificence. Every minute, 24 Olympic-sized swimming pools of water fall 27 stories in height. A river almost as large as the Thames slides through the jungle and into midair to fall 226 meters and run down a valley more enchanting than any I have ever seen. In this stunning physical beauty, the Guyanas collided with colonialism. Out of the jungle, the Europeans carved these little demographic experiments that became what the Guyanas are today. In the next part of this video, we will look at the people's history of the Guyanas. <laughs> In telling the indigenous history of South America before Europeans arrived, nothing is certain due to a lack of written and even archaeological sources. With little stone to build with, the jungle pretty quickly has reclaimed most of what the indigenous people left behind. As a result, much of what I discuss here is going to be about what the Europeans did. Regrettably, the Amerindian perspective on all these things is largely missing. This is because the European sources are more or less the only ones we have. So whenever I say something like unexplored, that is always and obviously with the caveat that Amerindian people had been living in the Guyanas for millennia and knew the land better than anyone did either before or in fact since. Now, you'll also notice I'm using the word Amerindian. Unlike in other parts of South America, that is the most common word used in the Guyanas. While I was traveling in the region, I was talking to a Makushi girl who told me that there is actually debate within Amerindian communities about whether Amerindian or indigenous is the better word to use, so it's not settled. She told me that Amerindian remains the standard, and that's also what I've read, so that's what I'm using, even if that isn't usually used elsewhere in South America. So this is what we know. The Guyanas were largely populated with Arawak-speaking people. 
These are the same people that spread throughout the Caribbean islands, eventually being partly replaced by the Caribs, who also came from the Guyanas, and who gave the Caribbean its name. These two groups, the Caribs and the Arawaks, are who met Alonso de Ojeda's first expedition from Spain at the Essequibo River in 1499. After sorting through a few names, the Europeans called this area the Wild Coast. In theory, Spain was the first European empire to claim this area, as well as the rest of the Western Hemisphere, with the Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494, when the Pope split the world between the Spanish and the Portuguese. But even then, it wasn't until 1499 that the Spanish sent a ship, and they didn't stop for long. It was another 30 years before anyone tried to land, and they were attacked by the locals. Spanish interest understandably diminished after this, and they only ever occupied the northwest end, which is now part of Venezuela. The Portuguese colonized the southern portion, which is now the Brazilian state of Amapá, and the bit in between, well, that was up for grabs. So with the Spanish losing interest, the first proper European explorer was the Englishman Walter Raleigh in 1594. He was searching, like many at the time, for El Dorado. He told of rumors of a city made of gold and described attractive women with an environment overflowing with bounteous food, which stimulated more European interest. The people that became the pilgrims in the United States actually flirted with the idea of planting New England along this coast. By the end of the 1500s, the Dutch were beginning to sniff around. They were the first to stitch together a viable economic entity. They were most interested in trade rather than colonization, and throughout the 17th century, the Dutch established trading outposts under the banner of the Dutch West India Company. They were always competing with the English, and both the English and the Dutch were periodically harassed by the Spanish and Portuguese, who argued that this was their land because the Pope said so. And the whole time settlements were collapsing because of being destroyed by the Spanish or Portuguese or because of conflicts with the natives. The French joined this game of musical chairs as well, though their first attempts collapsed within months. For the next 200 years, the three great European powers of France, Britain and Holland would snatch each other's colonies up and down the coast. These were wars that always began and ended in Europe, and there were nine of them. First Dutch, Second Dutch, Grand Alliance, Spanish Succession, Jenkins Air, Austrian Succession, Seven Years, American Independence, and Napoleonic. During this time, what is now Guyana changed hands nine times, Suriname six times, and French Guyana seven times. At one point, the Dutch had all three, and so did the British. But throughout these centuries, this entire game was played out almost entirely on the coast. The Dutch, for example, only ever visited about 4% of the land they claimed. So at the end of all this warfare, the Europeans carved out shares that more or less reflected their military power at the time. Britain got the biggest part, an area about as large as the UK itself. This would become Guyana. Dutch Guyana was half the size of this and would become Suriname. Then France was left with the smallest territory on the entire continent, which would become France. I mean, it's still literally a part of France, but we'll cover that later in the series. All of this, however, is not to say the borders are settled. Venezuela, for example, right now claims almost 70% of Guyana, another topic we're going to dive into in the next few videos. So what were the Europeans trying to do? By the 1700s, the Europeans were addicts, and they would pay any amount to get their fix. Their drug, of course, was sugar. An investor in sugar could double his capital in less than three years, and sugar from the Guyanas created millionaires in Bristol and Amsterdam. The Guyanas became the archetypal plantation colonies. Sugar dominated the economy of the Guyanas for over 300 years, creating a ruling class known as the plantocracy. Before its decline in the 1860s, sugar was 95% of British Guyana's exports. Sugar has shaped the Guyanas, transforming both the population and the landscape. You can still see it from space, mile upon mile of oblongs, sugarcane fields. For each square mile of cane, 10 million tons of earth needed to be shifted and 65 miles of drainage canals dug. And none of this work was done by Europeans. After finding that the native people weren't suitable as slave labor, mostly due to their susceptibility to old world diseases, the mass importation of Africans began. These colonies were entirely the creation of slaves. They chopped the wood, stacked the bricks, dug the canals, cleared the roads, planted the cane, and harvested the sugar. The history of almost everyone in the Guyanas, in one way or another, leads back to slavery. It's in the language people talk, the food they eat, and of course, in the people themselves. All the Europeans got involved in the slave trade. 
The Dutch brought the first slaves in 1652, and even minor players like the Danes and the Swedes brought human cargoes to the wild coast. But it was the English who made this an industry. By 1760, they had a fleet of 146 slave boats, capable of carrying 36,000 slaves. To quote John Gimlet again, no one knows how many African lives were merged with the Guyanese clay, but it must be hundreds of thousands. This was the transatlantic slave trade, which between 1500 and 1840 transferred some 12 million Africans to the Americas. In the same period, around 3.4 million Europeans crossed the ocean as well. In other words, for the first three centuries of European colonization of the Western Hemisphere, for every European that came to the Americas, three Africans made the same journey. The crowds on the streets of this new America were African crowds. The farmers were African farmers. Until the later mass migrations of Europeans at the end of the 19th century, demographically speaking, the colonization of the Americas was an extension of Africa into the Western Hemisphere. And nowhere was this truer than in the Guyanas. The slaves were given new names, erasing their history, and they learnt the languages of their masters, usually English. Throughout Guyana and Suriname, the most widely spoken languages today are Creoles. Guyanese Creole in Guyana and Srinantongo in Suriname. There are also the languages of the Maroon communities in Suriname and French Guyana, like Saramakan, Induka, Matawai, and Quinti, all based on English, though with substantial injections of African, Amerindian, and other languages. One of them, Induka even has its own script. And today's people of African descent are themselves divided into Creoles, who are mostly located along the coast, and Maroons, who are descendants of people who escaped slavery and settled in the interior regions, self-sufficient and beyond the reach of Europeans for literal centuries. In Suriname, almost one in six people are descended from Maroons or runaway slaves. For 200 years, they lived completely separately in the interior, speaking their own languages and practicing their own religions. In fact, in some ways, there was as much or more African culture in the jungles of the Ghanas as there was in parts of Africa. Theirs is a fascinating story, which we will delve into in the Suriname videos. Chattel slavery made slaves anonymous. They were something to be bought and sold in stores entirely based on their physical characteristics. And the slave owners that ultimately owned them, for the most part, never even set eyes on them. They were thousands of miles away, safe from the disease and the heat, getting rich in London or Paris or Amsterdam. From 1652 until 1870, when the Dutch finally ended it in their colony, slavery defined the Guyanas. Meanwhile, as their lands were invaded by people from other continents, the Amerindians were forced back into the hinterland. Now they make up only about 3% of the population of the three Guyanas. However, even they played their part in the slave trade, respected for their skill in tracking down runaways and taking a place in the colonial hierarchy, just below the whites. And then, into this story we have another group of people, because for all of the scale of the transatlantic slave trade, the largest ethnic group in both Guyana and Suriname today is not African, and it certainly isn't Europeans, it is Indian. And no, I'm not talking about indigenous people from the Americas, I'm talking about Indians from India. After the abolition of slavery in the colonies, the plantations still needed labor, and so Indians were brought as indentured servants. Now they are about 40% of the population of Guyana and over a quarter of Surinams. They too are a massive part of the story of the Guyanas, as you will soon see. To make it more complicated, you have the Hmong communities brought by the French from Indochina to French Guyana, and in Suriname, the substantial community of Javanese who were recruited from the Dutch colony of Indonesia, now making up well over 10% of the population. The Guyanas, you could say, are a demographic science experiment composed mostly of people who didn't really want to go there. So that, broadly speaking, is the story of the Guyanas. In this series of videos, we will look at each of them in turn. The history, the society, the politics. There's a lot going on.